let's get it going. Let me share my screen. Cool. So today we got a guest professor coming in, Professor Eddie Reyes from Seattle, Washington. And he's going to teach us about diversity in the tech industry. All right. Thank you, Eddie. All right. For, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm a, uh, I, I do, you know, several things. Uh, my main profession is a software engineer. Uh, but uh, I've, I've done a lot of work in the diversity space for the last uh, about seven years, um, starting out in Austin. Uh, and uh, we, I've done a lot of work uh, in building up a pretty big community uh, out in Austin that uh, is going to grow uh, into several different places, uh, as we'll talk about a little bit. But uh, I want to talk in this presentation uh, a little bit about the, you know, the general problem uh, as it faces the tech industry um, and some of the some of the causes and the underlying, you know, trends and forces that, that make it this way and you know, how we can do something about it. So uh, the, you know, the, the state of uh, diversity in the technology workforce is a, a pretty, you know, well documented problem. Uh, there's, there's a lot of statistics out there that show, uh, you know, how lots of different groups um, are underrepresented relative to their proportion of the workforce. Um, and this is, uh, you know, you, you can you can really see this uh, in a stark way if you look at the the overall statistics of Latinos in the workforce. They comprise 16.7 percent of the workforce. They comprise 7.8 7 percent of all tech workers, and I think in the in the bigger tech companies that number is even lower. Uh, and then you look at other uh, you know industries: hospitality, construction, agriculture. Big, big overrepresentation. Right. Um, and uh, the basically the, the tech industry is is really uh, they're, they're very focused and willing to improve this. Uh, they they struggle in being successful on it. Uh, it's it's very you know, the, there's other industries that we can point out too where uh, the tech industry is not the only industry that has, uh, you know, this uh, this diversity problem. Um, but what makes the tech industry, um, what gives them, what gives the tech industry a lot of urgency uh, and importance to fix this problem, is that technology, unlike other things, has an instant uh, effect on billions of people. Um, it uh, it has it has a you know very great benefits uh, across the world to many people, uh, practically instantly, uh, because it's basically the way that you know information is is uh, is is spread and you know for ill or good um but uh these these companies struggle uh to effectively understand all of the different markets and all of the different people that they're serving because of their diversity problem and that's why it's it's a uh, it's such a oppressing problem for them to solve uh and uh you know, as, as everyone knows, in, in this last year, this, you know, in, in the broader society, the, you know, the, the racial inequality problem has really, really come to the fore. And it's, it's really impossible to ignore. And it's very difficult to, uh, to progress and to, you know, and to, to affect positive change in the way that, you know, things need to go. So, you know, why is this such a difficult problem? Right. It's it's a, I, I don't think that the problem is that all oh, the companies are run by like a bunch of racists or something. I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think uh, I think most companies genuinely uh, want to do better. Um, but the, the problems, you know, are, are very deep and they're very, uh, you know, uh, systemic. So uh, it has to, I think part of it has to do with the nature of wealth. Um, so, uh, you know, an interesting factoid that I found in, in, a, in an article a while ago is that uh, in Florence, Italy, the richest families in the year 1427 are still the richest families today. And that really hasn't changed a lot in, you know, hundreds of years. Um, and looking at, you know, this country, uh, you know, uh, people of color are, are very, very uh, way behind uh, you know, in terms of wealth and net worth. 
And it turns out that just like wealthy is sticky, poverty is very sticky too. And uh, there's there's cycles that perpetuate wealth and there's cycles that perpetuate poverty. And it's very difficult, uh, even across generations, uh, to to escape poverty. Thinking about how this applies a bit more immediately uh, to the tech industry, <clears throat> and keeping in mind these you know these underlying sort of systemic forces, uh, you you know you have these uh, these incentives that. Uh, make the workforce the way it is, right? The primary way technology companies recruit is uh, through the personal networks of their employees. So uh, somebody already works in a, in a large company, they'll refer their friends. Uh, their friends are likely to have the, the same level of, uh, you know, of competence and education that they do. They're also very uh, likely to look just like them. Um, and then uh, going beyond the, the recruitment from personal networks, uh, you have this uh, this concept of university pedigree, right? Um, so to give an example, right, uh, U University of Texas Austin is the top ten engineering school. They're in the top ten uh, uh, graduate programs for both computer science and and different forms, different disciplines of engineering. Uh, yet, if you compare the the recruiting of the biggest tech companies, uh, you know, pretty underrepresented compared to say, you know, Stanford. Uh, you know Harvard and the the, the big names, and uh, it's a uh, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty specious claim to say that you can't find uh, people that can do this work that you need done, you know, in places other than that. But it's it's a mindset that that's prevalent. It's it's a uh, it's changing and improving a bit now, especially in this last year. Um, but these are some of the immediate challenges that these companies are trying to do better at. Uh, they're they're trying to change, you know, how they recruit people. Uh, the numbers have improved slightly, but they haven't improved uh, dramatically yet. So uh, I'm going to get a little bit into some of the work that I've done in the last couple of years in this space and how we think about this problem, and you know maybe show a, a you know show a better way forward that at least from the grassroots uh, we can affect some change and we can uh, you know get closer to to uh, you know, improving the situation. So uh, the last uh, six years or so, uh, I've started a group in Austin called the Austin Hispanic Hackers. Very basic idea at the beginning of just, uh, you know, who, where are the Latinos in tech at? You know, let's all hang out and let's all, uh, you know, talk about stuff that, that's interesting to us. And, uh, and, and from, from those beginnings, I've been uh, deeply plugged into both the, uh, the supply side of this and the companies that are recruiting people and that are looking to improve their, uh, you know, their, their, uh, their statistics basically. And, uh, in doing that, uh, what, what we discovered is that we're in a unique, uh, place in, with a group like this to establish this, this cycle of wealth. Right. And this is how, uh, you know, ver various, uh, cycles of wealth have been established in places like Silicon Valley. And, and this is especially like new wealth in new places where new, very valuable things have been created. And therefore there's been, uh, you know, a lot of people that have, you know, uh, come into wealth where there weren't a lot before. This, this isn't something that happens super frequently, but it, it definitely happens in some places and it can be nurtured uh, if you harness the, the right forces, uh, you know, underneath you. So, uh, with a group like Hispanic Hackers and and other communities like this, um, the the idea is you empower people who have some level of success today to help others in the community uh, that might look at them as role models or that might uh, be able to leverage a connection with these people to uh, get an op a new opportunity that they couldn't have otherwise had. And uh, by doing this, you have... Uh, successful people in companies, you have successful entrepreneurs that, you know, come into wealth. And then most importantly, underlying this all is you have the, the network of learning and teaching that comes with, uh, with a cycle like this. And uh, over time, and over a couple of generations, the wealth gets bigger in this group and gets bigger. And that's basically um, what we're trying, what we've been trying to uh, bootstrap in the Latino community, at least in Austin. 
And so in the last few years, uh, you know, we've actually made a, a ton of really cool progress. You know, we have, we, we got to 2000 plus members uh, in Austin. Um, we, we've put on hundreds of events uh, of all kinds, everything from how to start your own company to, uh, you know, how to uh, basically practice for coding interview, uh, all pro bono. Uh, we, uh, we, we have events where, where people come in, they might be, uh, they might have an imminent job interview coming up and we, we grill them with the, the types of coding interviews that they'll get in, in the real world, uh, maybe even harder. And, you know, we've, we've had people that, uh, have both been connected to employers at these events. And we've had people that have, you know, basically called me after the fact to thank me that they got some job that they wouldn't have gotten if it wasn't for these events. Um, we've also, uh, supported dozens of entrepreneurs in tech and we've gotten, you know, the, the, the most, uh, successful entrepreneurs, Latino entrepreneurs in Austin to, to tag along and host events with us and, uh, and spread the word. And we've built a pretty cool, you know, club. And I think one of the, one of the things that sets, uh, Hispanic hackers apart from other groups is that, uh, we're, we're actually open to everybody and we don't, uh, you know, we, we don't do things exclusively for Latino folks. Um, that this is a contrast to other groups that are diversity focused, that are a little bit more insular. Uh, but the way we see it is, you know, you, you come, you know, you come and, uh, and share in this group, uh, you know, so that you can uh, distinguish yourself as a Latino member of the tech industry, or uh, if you're not Latino, uh, you can come and see who are the Latino folks in the tech industry. And uh, maybe, maybe you are uh, a person of, you know, of whatever, you know, ethnicity, uh, you come to our group and you benefit from, you know, our free interview training. And uh, you've just been leveled up by Latino folks in the tech industry. Uh, it's fine, you know, it's, and, and it's great. I think it's a really cool exchange. And it really, uh, it really helps the, the dynamic and the openness and the positivity um, cause more than anything, you know, it's, it's, we, we do this to, to show who's who, who are the role models, uh, and, uh, to be positive, you know, like, uh, just foster some positivity rather than, you know, uh, uh, you know, a lot of negativity that, you know, this, this kind of, uh, effort typically has. Um, and so for us, uh, you know, just about Hispanic hackers specifically, um, you know, we, we want to grow this, this cycle and, you know, and bootstrap it in this community. So obviously, uh, expansion is in the cards. Uh, we're, we're expanding to a couple of additional cities. Um, we're making, we're formalizing things a little bit more. We're for, forming a 501c3. Um, and we're going to continue to focus on, uh, the learning aspect of our group, which we are very strong at at the moment and we're going to continue to get uh, better at that and we're we we hope to offer uh at some point in the future a a free curriculum like a like a coding boot camp type of curriculum for folks in the community um the coding boot camps are the most common way right now that people who change careers enter technology and they cost thousands of dollars and these uh these boot camps sometimes throw a scholarship or two our way, which we, which instantly get gobbled up by somebody in the community. Uh, we we want to establish uh, a a free curriculum for this community, uh, for the folks that are most interested and passionate about this, um, to give them all the means to you know enter the workforce, and uh, you know and and change their careers, which is the the, the most common uh, type of student that we encounter that comes to our group and is also doing this. And then of course the, uh, you know, since, since our goals are intergenerational and, uh, and they're very systemic, uh, the, the next uh, big growth area for this group is to, is community presence and our presence in K through 12 schools, uh, but especially rural communities. Uh, Cause if you remember from before the, you know, the, the, the Latino workforce is disproportionately represented in rural types of uh, industries. And we've had folks that come to our group uh, that, you know, that, that work on farms 
and are immigrants, but are interested for them and for their kids uh, to learn about technology. Uh, in, in some cases, they want to learn how to use a computer. Uh, in, in different cases, they actually have really, uh, you know, big ideas and imaginations and they, they just don't feel empowered to pursue them. In one case, I had a ranch hand show up to, uh, you know, one of our events and he had this idea that he wanted to help the, the ranch owner find lost cows with drones. And so he came to this group because he wanted to see, uh, you know, where he can learn about building drones. And um, this was a, a couple of years before we have the, you know, these nicely packaged drones. Back then you had to build like an Arducopter. Uh, I don't know if anybody ever played with those. And you had to set up, uh, you know, a little, uh, like, a, like a Linux uh, Raspberry Pi. So uh, I gave him all my, my Linux books. Um, oh boy, I thought I locked that door. <laughs> I'm 51 <laughs> pounds. Wow, that's great. Everybody knows that here in this call now. Yeah. Yeah, congratulations. Go. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah. So I gave him all my Linux books and Linux command line books, and he he uh, he he actually you know Jerry rigged a solution for this, and um, I want to reach more folks like him, and uh, you know and and basically it helped establish this cycle uh, in this community to uh, you know to help at least from the grassroots side uh, improve diversity in technology. That's my presentation. Um, Thank if you. anyone has any questions, we can talk more. Or... Cool. Great. Thank you very much, Eddie. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. All right. The floor is open to any questions. Does anybody have any questions? All right. We'll meet you. Yeah. Um, hey, uh, Eddie. Have, so have you started? Uh, meetups or online meetups in um in seattle uh, uh, that, since moving out there how, how long have you been in seattle and you know what uh what's been happening with hispanic hackers there yeah so so uh I, i've been in seattle since uh, early december um in austin we have a we have a really good board uh that has worked with me already for uh this particular group of people has worked uh, for a year and a half, two years in one case, uh, on helping do Hispanic hackers events. Um, they're, they're, they're doing an awesome job. They've already got like 2021 planned out and, uh, you know, different, even more events than we had before. And, uh, we have, uh, we have a volunteer that is based in San Antonio, who's going to be starting the first events, virtual events for now in San Antonio. Uh, and in Seattle, uh, I'm, we're almost settled in here. Uh, you know, and I may, uh, in a, in a, in a couple of weeks, I think we'll be in a, you know, sort of in a back to normal kind of mode when it comes to just like relocation and, you know, life in general. But, uh, when I get to that mode, um, yeah, there's, there's a, I've, I've observed that there's a pretty big need here in Seattle and there isn't a whole lot of stuff. And, uh, there's a, a couple of, uh, you know, loosely organized, uh, networking groups. That's where I'm going to start. Uh, trying to marshal all of those folks and then just put on some of the same kinds of events uh, out here. Since things are virtual, uh, it's, it's been interesting. We've had, uh, we've had about 20 to 25% of our attendees uh, come from California now. Uh, they're in California and they attend our virtual events. They've done, we, we've, we've turned our, our interview practice uh, into a virtual type of event. And um, it's, it's, it's been really cool. I mean, it, it's actually great practice as a virtual event because all coding interviews are now virtual anyway. So uh, that, that works out pretty nicely uh, as it reflects the reality. Could you uh, walk us through a, uh, a coding practice event uh, just a little bit more with a little more detail? Yeah, uh, so, so the way it works is um, we, we get two sets of volunteers. Uh, you know, one, one set of volunteers are the people that want to practice their interview skills. Uh, we, we, we have a sign-up sheet. People sign up, uh, the, you know, it's first come, first serve because we have limited number of slots. Um, when it was in person, uh, we would do this in uh, a place called Capital Factory in Austin. And they had a bunch of whiteboards. I'd steal all the whiteboards in the building <laughs> and I'd bring them down to the event space before the event started. And uh, 
the other set of volunteers are volunteers that are gonna, that are going to ask a question. So I have a question pool, um, which it's basically um, you know co uh, questions from leetcode.com. If anybody's ever uh, played with that site, and I ask each uh, ask you know each interviewer or volunteer to come with exactly one question. Like just you know take one question, know it really well, and then you're going to ask a bunch of people that question. So the the people getting interviewed. Uh, they they get paired up with an interviewer. They have 15 minutes uh, to get through the question, and then the people asking rotate. And then uh, and then that the interviewers get grilled with, you know, four different interview questions, which is sort of like a an accelerated small version of a of a big company coding interview type of exercise. Um, and of course, the question difficulties are calibrated so that it can be done in you know, 15 minutes. Sometimes the, the people asking questions are actually hiring managers. That's happened a couple times. And uh, I didn't know that till the, the event. I try to make it like no pressure, you know, like, look, this is no pressure. It's not, you know, uh, that, that helps the, the people practicing. Uh, but a couple of times, uh, yeah, the hiring managers come and they sort of exploit this, uh, <laughs> this exercise too to come and scope out candidates. And I know of, I know of one case where that resulted in a job offer for somebody, uh, you know, participating in, in the interviews because of a hiring manager that sneaked into my process. Nice. Very cool. All right. Any more questions? Yeah, Eddie. Um, so you mentioned that, uh, most of the people are there to, uh, they're like, uh, part of the community is mostly people that are job changing. I'm also wondering about the university output of, uh, I guess, Latinos in CS or minorities in CS in general. Um, yeah, uh, we so 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 in Austin, we were actually paired up with the uh, the the Latino student um, club that, for the computer science department of uh, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, we we get a we, we we do get a decent flow of folks from the university. Um, it, it's interesting because it, it turns out that at least in Austin, um, students in the university aren't really connected with the, uh, you know, the tech meetup circuit, which is substantial in Austin, but they come to our group, uh, I think because of all of these, uh, you know, training things that we do, and especially the seniors that are graduating, uh, we, we get, you know, a steady flow of those, uh, it, it's, it's different stripes. Uh, you know, we, I, I focus on the people that are changing careers. Um, because it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very obvious how to help them. And it's, it's also not just about helping them. It's also about empowering the other people that are there to help them so that they feel good about what they're doing and they feel like they're contributing to this community. And that is how, uh, people stick around and become volunteers and, and in some cases become volunteers for a very long time. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, any more questions? Um, you said it's available for everyone to um, to listen in on. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to join one of these meetings, um, when when do you guys usually uh, do these meetings? Uh, we our next one is uh, in a couple weeks, uh, February. 20 something i'll throw out the link uh, that'd be awesome yeah yeah definitely um yeah we we have a we have a calendar for the rest of the year i think next time it's a it's a training about uh javascript is that okay. february it might be march well i gotta look at the calendar but yeah we we have uh events scheduled right now they're scheduled on meetup.com uh okay. we're that's a vestige from when we were an in-person only uh kind of event uh, but um, and meetup.com was the best way to get foot traffic to show up to your events. But yeah, we're expanding to many different platforms. Um, uh, currently, it's a Zoom call. Um, I would like to explore other other ways, but it's kind of hard to multi-stream <laughs> like a conference into different platforms. Maybe that's a product idea somebody could build. But um, yeah, that would be nice that we can multi-stream on Zoom and you know, uh, but but have it be uh, have people able to participate because we can live stream on different platforms, but it's difficult for them to chime in or talk if they have a question. 
uh, are you accepting volunteers? I know we have some engineers here who may may uh, want to be able to also help in some way, help interview. Always, yeah, for sure. Yeah, our our our, our next coding interview uh, event is coming up, and uh, that that's an easy event to volunteer for. Um, another another type of volunteer is uh, more at the planning level. Um, which involves uh, engagement with the local community. And uh, yeah, we need help there too. And if, you know, if anybody wants to get this going out in the Bay Area, hey, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're all ears. We'd love to work with you. All right. Any other questions or discussions on the topic or? This is usually where Charles uh, chimes in. <laughs> Mm -hmm. There's well, no, I mean, it's, um, you know, this is hard stuff, you know, learning software is hard stuff. And uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I would just say that, um, I mean, the, the, my impression is that the university systems are not aligned with what people need to learn in industry. And so it wouldn't matter if you're, and so you, you're just not learning what you need to learn. And um, you, this this tracks all the way down, you know, all the way back through the education system. So, I mean, I think the problem with um, this disparity in hiring clearly has to be related to the the public education system. People aren't being taught what they need to learn to to go work. And uh, I have a PhD in quantum mechanics. I wasn't taught anything useful. So, I mean, in some sense, other than, you know, the, I mean, for this LNR stuff, it's useful, but for, you know, working in industry, it's not particularly useful. It's not as useful as, um, you know, you have to, you know, you have to learn a lot of this stuff you learn on the job or in a camp or something like that. And I, I think that that's, it's good. What you're doing is very good. Thanks, and, and, and I totally agree. I mean, I, I actually, I actually know of a few folks that were uh, UT computer science, uh, you know, juniors or seniors, who went out and did some internships and felt the need to do a boot camp, in addition to their university curriculum, because they didn't feel that they they were prepared with like the proper tools and the, you know, there's there's the you know you you, you can learn your you know like discrete math and 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 the the things you learn in a cs university curriculum which are great I'm, I'm like fans of those things i like those things but there's uh there's a lot of um uh you know very practical skills and it's an extensive body of practical skills that you need to know to to be successful and there's there's a big gap in folks that graduate with nothing but a university degree and ability to immediately produce on the job so yeah, that's that's definitely a huge problem in 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 the software industry at least. Well, then we're talking about the tech industry, right? So I mean, that's um, yeah. I mean, I, the other thing, of course, is that look, I mean, the the issue in diversity has to be related to the. Um, you have to look at the rate of change of demographics. You know, if, if the demographics mm -hmm. are changing very very rapidly, um, there's going to be disparity. Because people, you know, you have to, you know, people are coming from other places and they're showing up. Um, some of them, you know, some people come from countries which have extremely strong education programs. You know, you know and others come from places that do not. And <laughs> that diversity is going to be reflected when they show up here. I mean, the, you know, um, they're, they're uh, I mean, I, I think that um, even our own, you know, in, we see this reflected in the tech industry. I mean, it certainly was the case in, um, even a lot of communist countries have extremely good education systems. They just don't, you know, they just, you know, they, you know, they just come here because they can't start companies there. So yeah. I, I think that that's got to be part of the equation because, um, you know, I mean, you have some, some places have large national education programs that are very, very, um, that are very, very well developed and very well funded. We, we don't have that. <laughs> yeah. in this country you know it, it, i mean we have uh so and um i mean we're, we're ranked we, we, i mean every year we're ranked next, near the bottom it's ridiculous um and and, and then they just you know it's, these are uh um I, and i think that reflects across the board 
So um, I guess this is a two part question for you, Eddie. Um, uh, we, yeah, we both went to the university for engineering and we both left uh, to go into the workforce pretty ill prepared for some of the stuff that we had to deal with. And we just learned on the job. While a uh, boot, boot camp teaches you exactly what you, I think, would need for a job, but then there's a lot of engineering background, mathematics, and all these other, uh, you know, uh, thinking that's not included. Um, what, you know, there's a practical sense of getting a job and being able to perform at the job. There's also something really good about having the, the tools to be able to adapt to any new job that kind of comes out at you. Uh, what type of hybrid program would you suggest people kind of, you know, learn or, uh, or would you want to teach them, you know, to, to be able to have, you know, a little bit of each of these skills? Yeah, I, I think both are important and very useful. Um, I think the problem uh, that the university setting has, at least for computer science programs, is, you know, their goal is ostensibly uh, research. And that's kind of a different goal from, you know, being in the industry, building systems that, you know, that, that do more concrete things. Uh, I think there, I, I think there has to be a little bit more, I guess, vocational focus, because one of the things universities will say is that we're not a vocational program. You know, we, we, we teach computer science. And, um, and, you know, and, and our goals are aligned around properly teaching computer science uh, or, and, the, and the science behind this. Um, and the, what people do in practice, like I said, is they supplement their university education with, uh, with a boot camp, you know, education. Um, or they, uh, some folks are very effective at actively engaging in open source projects. Uh, while they're in the university. Um, and I think gaining exposure to those kinds of projects through uh, internships is a super valuable thing that a college student can do for themselves uh, to, to better prepare themselves for the workforce. Um, one, one of the programs that Hispanic hackers participated in, uh, in partnership with a company called data.world uh, based in, in Austin is uh, we had a uh, a uh, you know a guest day at the office program and uh, it was done in conjunction with uh, a different group that we collaborate with a lot called the austin urban technology movement and what we did is we you know we we got from a pool of uh, interested high school students um, a group that took a field trip to data.world and uh, they got assigned an engineer uh, and the engineer basically you know walked them through a work day. And that really uh, kind of blew their minds. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, they, they, you know, it was, it was very exciting for them involved. Uh, the engineers had fun. Um, it was kind of like a, a no pressure, you know, uh, I don't think the engineers had like a crazy deadline or anything that day, but uh, um, it, I think, uh, I think the, the, you know, academia um, should do what it does, but it needs to be supplemented with real world experiences. Uh, experiences with companies and also um, training and tools. It's also difficult as a university to keep up with the changes in tools. Like, you know, the, there's there's university professors who are still fed up that they have to do stuff in Java because it's a newfangled thing that they don't care about. But the problem is it was newfangled 20 years ago. And, you know, uh, tenured uh, faculty <laughs> is such that, you know, 20, they're, they're, they're there way longer than 20 years. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that, that also uh, contributes a little bit to the situation at the university. Um, so I, I think the, the, you know, the, there has to be learning on both sides. And right now it's completely driven by the ingenuity of the student to navigate this uh, and figure this out for themselves. Yeah, this is Carl. I think the freshness of the boot camps is great because one of the great things about being a computer science uh, young worker is that in a normal field, the guy that's been there 20 years knows things you'll take 20 years to learn. But in computer science, it gets reinvented about every six years. 
Yeah. So you only need to learn six years of stuff to be the smartest person there. I mean, or the, so it doesn't, the older stuff isn't that relevant most of the time. So it's a huge leg up for a young professional to not have to worry about all these people that you'll never be better than. Very true. Yep. Uh, there, there's a, there, there's definitely uh, an age gap in the software industry. And like you said, it's, it can be difficult if uh, you're very experienced, but in a narrow slice of things that, uh, might have been obsoleted by now, and there's a that, that a lot of folks come to our program actually because they they feel like their skills are obsolete and they need to re-educate themselves on the new technology. There's always fundamental skills that are valuable, but uh, yeah, in this field, the 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 churn is is pretty significant, uh, and there's a lot of ground to cover for somebody who who hasn't kept up to date. For sure. And yeah, it's easier for a young person who, well, whatever they just learned, you know, in, in, in the prime of their lives is what they'll excel at and they'll just go kick ass in a company, um, you know, for the for the next few years. Okay. My, my last question is on the entrepreneurship side, right? Like the, the virtuous circle uh, or cycle that you presented here. I'm, I'm always interested in how do we... Uh, how do we develop uh, entrepreneurs in just all these different areas, right? Not just Silicon Valley, um, but how do we uh, take some of these models and then re repurpose it for these different demographics and these different geographical areas? Yeah, the, the, the number one problem that entrepreneurs have when they come to Hispanic hackers is uh, a skills gap. They, they have a big idea, uh, they want to test it, and they don't have the means to, so they come to Hispanic hackers uh, to find uh, somebody that either they can pair up with or to to learn uh, to figure out what it is they need to go learn uh, in order to you know to do what they need to do. Um, the there's there's a a common misconception that I see with entrepreneurs is that they they have to be you know elite hackers to to build something, and since they're not, they can never build anything. Uh, so there's a lot of encouragement <laughs> that's needed uh, in this in this group, um, and uh, and I think there there's a good opportunity to match um, you know people that are learning skills with uh, people that need uh, you know folks to execute on experiments. Uh, so there, there's a big networking opportunity between entrepreneurs and students, and uh, I think there's also a a big opportunity to just as a moral support group. I think that's actually very valuable for uh, entrepreneurs. Um, and the, the, the fact that it's a, it's a Latino group uh, is of course uh, like a, a magnet to Latino entrepreneurs. You know, they, that, that's a, that's one way to connect uh, mm -hmm. with, with a, a group of these folks uh, to give them support and to feel like, you know, somebody's like cheering for them. All right, very cool. All right, does anybody have any other remaining questions for today? All right, if not, I'm gonna stop recording.